Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Terrace here, aka the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. You know, we had an exciting Game 1 win against the Philadelphia 76ers. It came down to the fourth quarter. Crunch time minutes, man, between Josh Hart, Miles McBride, Mitchell Robinson. You already know what it was, man. We, we recapped the last night. If you haven't caught up, make sure to catch up with last night's show. And today, we got to get ready for Game 2, all right? And who better to help me get ready for Game 2? None other than my guy, RB, founder of 76ers content and 76ers content creator of Philly Take with RB. RB, how you doing, man? How you feeling today? Doing good, man. Could have been a little better after last night. Uh, tough loss. Knicks earned it at the end of the game. Obviously, a emotional roller coaster for us Sixer fans, but ready to bounce back for game two. Appreciate you having me on, and uh, hopefully the Sixers can nab one on the road tomorrow night. Hey, man, we'll see what's going to happen tomorrow. But before we get into breaking this game down, make sure you hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done, already done so. And make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. So, RB, give me your thoughts, man. Give me your thoughts about game one. I want to know from a Sixers standpoint, a Sixers fan standpoint, what did you think as, you know, what, what were the emotions that were going through? Because I'm sure quarter, first quarter, you're like, yes. This is exactly what I want to see from Embiid. This is exactly what I want to see from Maxi. Then, it, you know, the third, the the tide turns for the Knicks, goes back to the Sixers in the third because Maxi started getting going. You know, you almost had, you had Embiid with a scary fall. Walk me through it, man. Tell me what you were feeling during yesterday's game. Yeah, so I think coming into the series, you know, there's one main question that was above all else. You know, what will the health of Joel Embiid be? Like, will he be able to be that MVP caliber player? What will his knee give or take? And, he, you know, he comes out of the gate and he drops 15 in the first quarter. And let's be honest, he was cooking Hartenstein. He was cooking Robinson. All those boys, They nobody had an answer for Joel Embiid until the second quarter. And, you know, after the Sixers went up 12 or 14, whatever it was, like you said, the whole tie turn and Joel Embiid performs one of the best plays I've ever seen him make a self alley oop. But with that comes consequences. And looking back on it, you know, you can say shoulda, coulda, woulda, but overall, he probably just should not have made that decision to make that play. And he goes down the entire momentum flips. And here come the Knicks, the physical, gritty Knicks, and they're working their way back. And then they end up taking the lead. And I was surprised that Joel even came back in the game after halftime. I thought at one point, I mean, especially when he went down, I was like, uh-oh, like the whole series is in jeopardy. Things are not going to go well. I don't know how he came back. I think down, you know, later in the game, his knee probably wasn't giving him a lot of lift and movement, but he still battled. You know, he was out there and he gave it his all. His all. But unfortunately, you know, the Knicks just came in clutch and it's what they've done all season. They've had these guys, whether it's Josh Hart or – you know, Miles McBride, we'll talk about him, I'm sure, off the bench, giving you over 20 points. I mean, that was the difference in the game, and the Sixers gave them way too many possessions. So I think there was some positives to take out of this game, but it almost feels like it was the game that the Sixers should have stole, and they just didn't capitalize on the opportunity, and it's frustrating. I can, I can, I can understand from, like, that standpoint, like, frustrating, because I was feeling that same way at points throughout the game where it's, it's just – Decision making, right? It just comes down to decision making in a high pressure moment. Like, why are you making that play? Like, there was a point in the third quarter where Dante was out there, and after MB just injured his knee, and he decides to drive baseline. He has Maxi trailing, and you just see him instead of go up and say, you know, let me test to see if Joel Embiid still wants to be that rim protector. He makes a pass to Mitchell Robinson. I'm like, why are you doing that? Like, what, 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 what is happening in this moment? And even in the third and fourth, throughout the third and fourth quarter, I'm like, why are we jump passing? Why are we making reckless passes as the Knicks? It's like, this is a tight game. You cannot give, especially a Nick nurse led team, any wiggle room to come back when you already have a lead. So I, I understand that, that frustration, but I got to ask and about Joel Embiid, like you already said it. Why even make that type of play when your knee is not even 100%? You know, you have beat reporters saying that he's 80%, 60%, whatever it may be. Like, do you think that he should continue throughout the playoffs? Because there's got to be that thought in a fan and even the front office's head where it's like, do we really want to risk Embiid on MVP caliber candidate player who was playing otherworldly to begin the season before he got injured? Do we really want to risk it this one playoff, like this one playoff, or do we want to like say, you know what? Yesterday was a scare. Let's put him on ice. Let's get him right for next season because 
we know how dominant he can be and what this team looks like when he's fully healthy. Yeah, and I, I think the difference is when you look at the Sixers with him versus without him, like we saw it in that second quarter, the Knicks completely dominated the Sixers. Like they aren't even remotely close to a competitive team without him. And I think that's the frustrating decision that comes into play. You know, if you take Embiid out of the equation, the Sixers have no chance in this series. I've come into the series saying if he's over 80% healthy, I think the Sixers can win. But I agree, you are risking his long-term health. And he's coming off a couple months removed from a meniscus surgery. And honestly, I feel for the guy. And I know a lot of people, you know, have this discourse and they talk negatively on him. But one thing I know about Joel is that no matter what, he's going to try to end the series and the season on the floor. And even if that means playing through a, you know, terrible injury and, and you saw him out there battling last night, again, I don't even know how he came back on the floor after that injury, but Somebody needs to have a talk with Joel and, in my opinion, let him know. Like, you can't take the Joel out of Joel. It's how he plays. But, you know, to attempt a self alley oop like that probably was not the best decision. Like, you cannot do those things if you are going to want to survive in an entire playoffs. I mean, Joel has not been healthy in the playoffs, and it's one of the main reasons why, you know, the Sixers get to this point and they can't get past it. And it's, it's really frustrating given the level of dominance of a player like him. So, um, yeah, I, I think the Sixers are in a tough spot now with his health. And again, it's it's the unknown. You know, will that knee recover? Will it not? And you are risking a very serious injury long term if he continues to play. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. That self alley oop, even as a fan for a second, even though I loved it, I was like, yo, that was that was pretty sick. I was like, holy snap, man, that's crazy. Like, and the thing is, you know, I, I, and I want to know your thoughts about this because I did catch your tweet. You talked about Knicks fans being a little, uh, a little overzealous with uh, Isaiah Hartenstein, Mitchell Robinson love because this is Joel Embiid. And look, he still got his, man. Even when he came back in in the second half, he ended the game with, what, 28, 29 points and still got his double-double as he usually does. So I want to know, what were, your, what were your thoughts on watching? I mean, Hartenstein was just – it was – brutal to watch for most of that game but what were your thoughts on Mitchell Robinson's performance last night on Joel Embiid yeah I thought it was one of the x factors of the game and you know just the toughness that Mitch brought and I knew the Knicks from the jump would try to you know press and beat a little bit kind of test that knee I thought Joel came out in a very dominant manner he wanted the ball he was attacking obviously there were a lot of whistles on both sides but later in that game knowing the health status of Joel, I thought Mitch came in and, man, he was awesome. Like, what do you have, four blocks off the bench and I think 12 rebounds. He just, he was an X-factor and the Knicks needed a big man like that to step up. And like you said, Hartenstein was having a rough night and I know Robinson's on a minute restriction, but he was one of the difference makers in this game. And I think going forward, I don't know if the Knicks would ever think about starting him or maybe playing him a little more minutes, um, but man, he made a real difference last night. and. Yeah, when it comes to the Nick fans, you know, obviously the emotions wrapped up in this. <laughs> I, you know, the the burning of the the jerseys and the chanting, we want Boston. Oh, I would man. Knicks fans, don't get ahead of yourself, right? You've seen that story before. You know, maybe you didn't learn from it last time, but it is a series, you know, and it is only one game. And if the Sixers could say steal game two tomorrow night, we have a real series on our hands. So I wouldn't get too far ahead. But it also depends, again, on the health of Joel and whether the Sixers have it, have the energy in the tank to bounce back. Look, man, I'm all for uh, I'm all for the Knicks fans getting a little ratty. I didn't like the there's there's two things I didn't I didn't like last night uh, after after the vic, after the victory was one. I did not like the Joel Embiid jersey burning. I feel I, I don't even know. I can't even count that as part of the fan base. I don't know who uh, or what section of the fan base that is. Shout out to Robert Kearns, who, who's a good follower on Twitter. Uh, he commented saying, like, you know, 99.5% of the fan base would not do anything of that nature, would not even acknowledge thinking of it like that. But then you always had that 0.5% that goes out there and wants to do something a little crazy. I'm like, that, that, that's that's stupid. The other thing that bothers me is Trey Young. When we start transiting Ch- F Trey Young, I'm like, guys, he had one playoffs he had one good playoffs all right that, this man should not live rent free in Knicks fans head the way that you show you don't even care about this guy is not even thinking about this guy because that is look he, his team's not even in the playoffs man got smoked all right please let's just for, he got smoked by the Bulls who then they got smoked by a Jimmy Butler list uh you know heat team so what does that say about the Hawks 
please. Right. I don't need n- none of that. But I'm all for fans, man. Just like saying, we want Boston. Look, it has been, we had two decades and I know you, you're an Eagles fan. You know how it is, man. You got your, you saw Nick Foles win the first Super Bowl against Tom Brady. You know, every just little bit of a win, just getting closer and closer to the promised land. You know, you, you got it. You got to enjoy it and embrace it, especially when you've watched a franchise that has suffered. So I'm all cool with saying, Hey, you want to, you want to think far ahead, but yes, it is a game to game, you know, series. Like we won game one. All right. We put that, we put that in the books. Move on, focus ahead to game two, because what happened in game one does not matter for game two. So I'm I'm with you on I'm with you on that. But salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another game of the week preview. Appreciate all appreciate all of you for tuning in. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fancy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a one hundred dollar match. And with me on the other side is my guy RB. You can go catch him on Philly Take with RB. He covers the Philadelphia 76ers on that channel. Does a fantastic job. So make sure to give him a follow and make sure to tap in. Look, man, I, I, I like I like listening to you after the game too because I'm like, what are Sixers fans saying right now, man? And I feel like it gives a good balance of like what's happening. So well, well, if, I, if I could jump in for a second, um, let me, let me kind of twist it on you now and ask how do you feel? Because Sixer fans, I'll tell you, I was surprised the discourse was a lot more positive than I thought. Like, they're going, we have the Knicks right where we want them. Jalen Brunson did not play that well. And if it wasn't for Josh Hart, you know, hitting more threes in a game last night than he did all season, the Sixers may win that game. If it wasn't for a, you know, 21-point or whatever, 23-point game from McBride, you know, the Sixers may have nabbed that W. So I would ask you, are you confident more confident in the Knicks after last night, given that Brunson didn't play that well, but you still were able to pull one off? Or are you a little bit worried now uh, based on, you know, what nurse threw at him last night? You know, I, I feel like there's uh, <laughs> I feel like there's like a, an angel and a devil on my <laughs> on my shoulder right now. And the devil's like, look, man, Brunson and Dante were just stinking up the joint last night to, to a certain degree. And you get away with a McBride, a Bogdanovich, Mitchell Robinson, like, and Josh Hart, like, full on almost masterclass execution to help win the game while Embiid and Maxi were still doing the damn thing last night. How can you not be positive that we can continue this momentum? JB comes back, Dante starts knocking down shots, and it becomes that much easier. The, the angel side of me is like, Alex. I know you're confident. I know you should be happy. Brunson doesn't have bad to bad, back to back, back to back, bad games. Like he just does not do that. Um, but let's also understand we're talking about role players over here that they're role players because of the lack of inconsistency on the offensive side of the ball. So for me, I'm like, yes, I feel confident because if the Knicks can do this, like without Brunson being at his uh at his best, then yes, I should move. I can be a little confident moving forward or somewhat confident moving forward because that's what they've just done this entire season is that any sort of adversity, whether it's in a game, whether it's after losing Randall, OG, Mitchell Robinson, you know, even when Brunson went down against the Cavs after playing one minute and you see a 47 minute performance from Miles McBride and Josh Hart deciding to step up. I'm like, how can we not, how can I not be excited because they've done this before? I have to also kind of be realistic with myself and saying, are we going to get another masterclass from Miles McBride? And shout out to my guy, Andrew Claudio, because I saw I saw you guys do a preview and he and he mentioned uh, McBride coming through and that he did. There is going to be a McBride game. And he said a game. And that's what he did was the game. if McBride could continue to do this throughout the series, which I also have to look at. He's been pretty solid against the Sixers throughout the regular season as well. Um, like I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I can stay confident. So yes, I'm confident, but there's also the side of me, like it's nervous, man. Like you said, it's a game to game situation. I'm like game two could be completely different. And it typically is, man. I mean, we've seen in the past where whoever wins game one, game two is completely flipped, whether it's by players, refs, like, you know, deciding to to hold the whistle, well, well for a few more calls, pause on that. But it's like, you know, it's, that it's just the nature of the beast. So I'm in this weird place right now. I just need game two to be here so I could just see it unfold and see what happens. Although I'm sure it's going to be another roller coaster ride. Yeah, absolutely. And I would actually add on top of that from a Sixers standpoint that it is the most important game of the series. It is a must win in my eyes because if you go down two to nothing, then you're pretty much looking at 
probably having to win four in a row because in my opinion, I don't think the Sixers can win game seven on the road in MSG. I just think the environment will be too much. So I'm picking the Sixers to win in six. They have to get game two. And that's why I'm disappointed a bit because it felt like last night was the game to steal with Bronson playing the way that he did. However, I don't think the Sixers are out of it completely because of Nick Nurse. And I know he's a coach that's going to adjust on the fly. And I actually like what he threw at Bronson. He threw a couple different looks, Lowry, Oubre, you know, Batum, even Tobias. And he kind of got him off his rhythm a bit. But I do agree that, you know, Brunson is probably not going to have another tumultuous game like that. And he still made a couple big shots in the big moments. So um, it's going to be tough. But, you know, now the Sixers have a dilemma, right? Do they continue to play the way that they did? Or do they put more attention on Josh Hart? You know, they left him wide open in the fourth quarter. They reverted to his own defense, which I don't necessarily agree with. Like Hart has been clutch all season and you just let him shoot. You let him shoot. You let Ananobi wide open to shoot. You let McBride come out here and torch you off the bench. So uh, the Sixers are going to need a lot more tomorrow night if they want a chance to win. Yeah, and I guess the one thing from a Knicks standpoint is like, can we keep that momentum going, right? Can you keep that bench momentum going? Because to me, it's going to come down to the battle of the benches. And, you know, I know Uber was making some shots. Harris has just been, you know, tough to watch. And I'm going to ask you about that when we start previewing for uh, for this game too. But for me, it's always about momentum. And like, you could be confident, like as a Knicks fan, like I'm confident because if we, I chose the Knicks at six just because if Embiid is not healthy, that's just kind of a determining factor. If, as yeah. we saw, he looked much better in that first quarter than he did against Miami. And if he could do that, and who knows what game two will look like. I think that's just been the biggest question mark with Embiid is what does he look like game on a game to game basis? Maybe he wakes up feeling great and he clearly felt great yesterday because why else would you try a self put back alley-oop to, you know, and like you had to felt great to do st something like that. So we'll figure out, man, we'll, we'll figure we'll figure out and see what happens. So let's, let's, let's turn the script. Let's talk about game two. Let's talk about some adjustments that you expect to make. I'm going to ask you what, and it comes to Tobias Harris because I saw that tweet. I, 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 do you want him on the bench and do you want Batum starting? <laughs> 100%. And, you know, Sixer fans over the years have had to deal with, you know, the likes of different players who have kind of gone down this road. And I'm at the point where, personally, like, why not? Why not? Tobias is going to walk as a free agent. And on that tweet, mm -hmm. I said, are we in the business of trying to win a series or are we trying to hurt feelings? We get it. You're not the guy like you can be a, a productive player. You can give us 15, but you're not going to be that third guy. And I think, again, it hurt last night in a game where Joel is banged up. Tyrese gives you 33. But where's that third punch coming from? And obviously, I'm not expecting Nico Batum to be the 20 point per game guy we saw in the play in. But he's just a better fitting player. He's a smarter player. He can defend better. And obviously, one thing which we'll touch on, I'm sure, is is the rebounding, right? Like. Tobias Harris just doesn't give you enough from the demand at that position. So I would 100% make the, the move. Nick Nurse did it in the Miami game. He benched Tobias in the fourth quarter. I'm surprised as to why he did not do it last night. And it is concerning. I mean, he just cannot be on the floor in the big time moments. Do you think it has to deal with, because even though he was struggling to find a shot, he went three of seven. Last night, one of four from downtown. Only got you seven points. He did get nine boards. And does that change anything that you to it to like your thought process? Because we're talking about the rebounding battle last night, and it was you know a big difference maker just for the Knicks to win by seven points. Um, Knicks had fifty five total rebounds. Seventy sixers had thirty three. Twenty three of the Knicks fifty five were just offensive rebounds alone. Do you still leave Tobias Harris out there as a guy who could just rebound because? Looking at everybody else, even Embiid, and I get it, Embiid like got his injury. He had eight. The next best, the best guy on your team for collecting boards was Harris. Yeah, I, I think it's more of an outlier. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think Tobias had five of those in the first quarter, and mm -hmm. that's actually what he does. You know, he comes out with a punch. You know, he'll give you five to ten points in the first quarter, and then he disappears. And I think a big turn was in that second quarter when Joel went down. And they ran the ball through Tobias five possessions in a row. And it felt like that was the moment 
where the Knicks went on a 10-0 run and they completely flipped the script. And I've just seen enough to know that he just can't do it consistently. Nothing against him personally, but it's time to put him in a different role. Like you, it's all about matchups in the playoffs. You have to match that physicality of the New York Knicks if you want to win this series. And his game just does not represent that at this point. So if I'm nurse and I trust a nurse, I hope he makes the move to go to Nico Batum or at least cut Tobias's minutes down to 20, you know, maybe stagger him more with the bench. But, you know, he's just he's really hurting this team right now. And I think it's clear to anybody who's watching the games. Man, and he was doing so well to start the season, too, man. It looked like he was like he looked comfortable after the the Harden trade. Like, but I I guess just go to all throughout. What what changed throughout the regular season for him just to take that turn and not be as productive as he was at the beginning of the season? Listen, man, this is what happens, and it's happened for five years. I'm telling you, he starts out or he has, you know, a hot stretch, or when the All-Star game starts to approach, he starts playing really well, and then he will just disappear. And I think now it's at a point where maybe he's mentally checked out, maybe he's looking towards the future, but, you know, he also, like, it's just, it's not there. And I think there's that pressure, that demand, given what he makes, you know, on a salary, like, you're supposed to be that guy. But I think he knows, like, I can't be that guy. And it is wearing on him. And, you know, I mean, for for the whole Joel Embiid injury, Kelly Oubre emerged as the next guy behind Tyrese Maxey. And at some point, you just have to eat the humble pie and just take a back seat and try to contribute, you know, how you can. And, And I've always said, you know, if you're not scoring the ball, at least give me 10 to 12 rebounds a game. You know, be a lockdown defender. Do something. Have that defining skill. He just doesn't have have it in, in any facet and it's frustrating to watch all right salute to Knicks nation thank you all again for tuning for another game of the week preview with me on the other side is my guy rb you can go catch him over at philly take with rb over on youtube he covers the philadelphia 76ers over there make sure hit that thumbs up button for your boys make sure to subscribe to the channel and remember to support our sponsor underdog fantasy let me tell you guys tell you something about our sponsor if you love having fun putting money down on a game or multiple games whatever it may be Make sure to download the app Underdog Fantasy because, look, if you want to do pickums, create a sheet between either two to five players, and you don't got to just stick to NBA. It could be all sports at once. You could say MLB, NBA. You know, you got hockey. You got playoffs going on for hockey and and basketball right now. You could mix and match all of them, and all you got to do is choose higher or lower for whatever statistical category you choose for them. So, for example, last night, I may I, I was the guy who was confident saying, you know what, Brunch is going to go out there, go get 31 and over 31 and higher than 31 and a half points. He obviously didn't. So my ticket got a little busted off of that. But hey, make sure to go do make sure to go download the app. Make sure to go support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFT to get up to a one hundred dollar match. And if you don't feel like doing pickups, invite your friends, do some drafts. Look, CP, CK, JD, the Knicks Chicken, myself, we all been doing the drafts and Hey, it's a little way to get some, uh, you know, some lunch money for the next day. So make sure to go support our sponsor. Use that promo code KFV to get up to a $100 match. And also remember, got another watch party. You can go to Sucker Punch tomorrow for game two. All right. 33, uh, 334rd Ave in New York, New York. Make sure to go over there. Hang out with all the Knicks fans. You know, it's always rocking and popping when you go over there to catch a game. So make sure to go to Sucker Punch tomorrow if you want to go catch game two of Knicks versus Sixers. All right, getting back to it. Arby, you, you mentioned uh, will Tom Thibodeau make the adjustment to put Mitchell Robinson back into the starting rotation, and I just don't – I don't think he will do that unless Harnstein has another stinker. And just because we saw through the beginning of the season – or not necessarily the beginning of the season, but – Midway through the season, after Mitch went down, they traded for OG and Anobi. That offense just opened up, and Hartenstein, who can work the high post and find guys who cut baseline or just down the middle of the lane, that's so important for what this Knicks team does, especially to get off to a good start in games. I just don't see that happening. I think, and I won't say it's like an aberration that Hartenstein had a, a, a tough, you know, outing against Embiid. I mean, pre, like outside of this season where – First time, even after the trade, he looked great. Uh, we we know that Hartenstein does have matchups, especially when both centers are healthy, that he just doesn't have it going that night. So I think Tibbs will give him another chance. Also, it was Mitchell Robinson's first game last night where he played 30 minutes coming back from injury. I don't think it, he wants to extend Mitch that much, even though Mitch had an awesome game last night. I don't think he wants to go 
off the rip and just say, you know what, Mitch, you played 30 minutes last night. We're going to have you do it again, even though you just had ankle surgery not too long ago and you're just recovering from it. I don't see that happening. Um, but I think more so towards the ball move and everything else. But I want to know, you, 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 are you expecting that to happen, I guess, because you mentioned it? No, I don't think it'll happen. I think you usually go with what works until it doesn't. Um, so I do think they'll keep Hartenstein in, in the starting five. But, you know, again, Robinson was an X factor. Even McBride was an X factor. Like the Knicks have these guys who can come in and punch you in the face. And I think if guys like Robinson continue to play with that level of toughness, it, it's going to make it really hard on Philly, especially if Embiid is banged up and and kind of dealing with what he is. But I will expect on the other side for Nurse to make adjustments. I think we'll see, you know, a couple different looks. I, I like what he did on Brunson, like overall. Um, but I know Brunson's coming back with another punch. So, you know, those game to game adjustments are huge. And I feel like the Sixers have never had that type of coach who's willing to make those adjustments. Uh, and I expect Nurse to do so. We've seen him come back down in series before. So I'm rocking with Nurse, man. I, I expect him to have an, a, a new formula for game two uh, and try to stop these Knicks. Because, he, I mean, he lived or died with it last night, and and the Knicks took advantage of it. But, you know, can Josh Hart do that again? Uh, can McBride do that again? I think those are legitimate questions, and, you know, maybe maybe the Sixers follow the same kind of philosophy. I, I will say this. Um, and actually before that, before I get into my whole Josh Hart thing, I will say I, I love that we're going to have a great coaching battle because, and especially shout out to my guy, Will Lou, who covers the Raptors. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard this, but when nurse was coaching the Raptors, he got the nickname Nick Thibodeau because of just how many minutes uh, he would play his players. And so to me, it's like, Oh, Tibbs versus Tibbs. But, and I, I like how the creativity is going to just come about from both coaches. I'm more impressed that Tibbs is, doing something from an offensive standpoint, not necessarily defensively, you know, maybe there's some switches here and there and like how you deploy OG and Anobi and stuff of that nature. But for the most part, he likes to run that drop, drop coverage like, and just stay true to that nurse defensively. Like he very well known for the boxing one with Fred Van Vliet against Steph Curry in the NBA finals. And the way that he was just saying, you know, what, let's go zone. You know what? Ubre, you guard Brunson, you know, Harris, get out there. Like everybody. I'm like, that is just, the, the trust and just on the fly is just so interesting because as I can only imagine as a player, when something change is constantly changing, you're like, you just, when you think you had it figured out, nah, now you got to figure it out again. And that's the one thing I give Nick nurse a lot of credit for is that for opponents, he always keeps them on their toes. So I'm looking forward to what he does tomorrow uh, from a Sixer standpoint and just how the Knicks are able to adjust from an offensive standpoint to that matter. But now getting back to Josh Hart and I, I saw there's, especially in the next fan base, everyone's like, can we really expect Josh Hart to execute because the way the offense was breaking down this, that, and the third, I get it guys. I don't like watching just the offense just sputter and then just like kick it out to somebody and you just put up a three. But I will say this, Josh Hart, when it comes down to wait in the shot clock has been very successful. Now I'm going through last season because this year he's been up and down and I'll give you those numbers too, but on very low volume, when there is between four to seven seconds left in the shot clock on 0.4 uh, three-point attempts, he is actually shooting 46% from downtown. When it is even less time, zero to four seconds on 0.3 attempts, he's shooting 48%. And now is that saying that's not a lot of volume. The amount of times that it happens is like, it's very minimal. And this season alone, he's been worse than that. It's gone from, such high numbers last season to actually uh, during this regular season, 30% uh, percent shooting with four to seven seconds left in the shot clock to then 27% with zero to four. So yeah, it's been up and down this season, but my point is, is that he is capable of doing this and that my thing, my theory for Josh Hart is that, and RB, I'm sure, I'm sure you played sports. I'm sure like when you're just not thinking and you're just doing it, that's when you play your best. It's like, you know, the, the instinct comes out and you can just execute. And I think for Josh Hart, I can trust him when he's just not thinking and just doing. Yes, he's going to be fine. The reason why he struggles in games is because he's just thinking way too much and just hesitant to actually execute. But I do think if he can just, I think this is just like getting your nerves out, shucking off, shaking off the rust, like he'll he'll be fine for tomorrow's game. So I actually do believe in, in Josh Hart because he's he's a big factor in what the Knicks do. Rebounding, facilitating, playmaking, 
and, and now it comes down to shooting because you don't have Randall. I, I have to trust him, and I think he will come up big. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, again, that was Nurse's mindset. Let's take Brunson out and let the others beat us. And, you know, it worked. It worked flawlessly. And, you know, I actually disagree with a lot of the Sixers fan base. You know, they were happy, you know, to kind of deploy that philosophy and, and let it go the way that it did. And I said, no, you can't leave guys wide open in the playoffs. I mean, this is a playoff team for a reason. This is a very good matchup for a reason. And, you know, Josh Hart has been clutch. He will kill you like that. And and I know it's not his typical thing to, you know, hit three, four, three pointers in a game, but then you have OG Ananobi. There was a blown assignment by Tobias. And I just don't think that will, you know, survive for the entire series. Now I will question on the other side. And this is, I guess, one of my questions about the Knicks in general, like, can they keep up this level of consistency? Can they be a deep playoff team, you know, with just Jalen Brunson, right? The centric Brunson offense, with the solid role players. Like, is that enough? Obviously, there's no Julius Randle. Everybody else is below 20 points per game. Like, can that survive in a playoff series? I think in this series, it definitely can, uh, given some of the little things that the Knicks do and given that that identity that they have. But, you know, again, I if the Sixers continue to go with what they've done yesterday and they leave Josh Hart wide open to torch you, I think he's going to do it again. And like you said, he's not thinking about it. He's letting it fly. Maybe tomorrow it could be a DiVincenzo game, you know? So I think the Sixers will have to adjust a little bit, um, and, and it definitely kills them not having Melton or Rocco in this series. Those could have been two really good wing defenders, but they're just kind of battling with what they have out there, you know? And it'll be interesting to see what what the, uh, I guess, what the strategy is tomorrow night. All right, two more questions, and, and then we can wrap it up here. Ar Arby, I have to ask you, you just had 33 points from Maxi last night. You had 29 from Embiid, who else are you calling upon at this point to just give you the scoring that you need on this team? Because, like, what what other direction do you go? I feel like you got the best that you could, like, even outside of an Embiid scare, right? I felt like you got the best possible, like, outcome from your top two players, and yet it still wasn't enough. So who else offensively needs to step up? Well, I mean, there, there's one guy I'd call, you know, he's not going to pick up the phone, but um, <laughs> other than him, uh, Kelly Oubre, I, I think has been, played really well down the stretch of the season. Uh, you know, there were games where he gave you 18, 20, even 25, and, and obviously he's a minimum player, but Kelly's come up big late in the season. Uh, Kyle Lowry, I thought, had a really good third quarter last night. I think he gave us 12 or 14 in that third, and he just showed a lot of the reasons you bring in a guy like Kyle Lowry. So, uh, I would expect those two to step up. Maybe you can get a little bit of a punch, you know, maybe uh, campaign or Buddy Heald. I mean, Buddy Heald has been lackluster since the trade, and it's frustrating, you know, given the the volume of threes that I guess we expected to get. But I'll tell you one name, and Knicks fans probably don't know who this is. His name is Ricky Council the Fourth, And hmm. if he gets minutes in tomorrow's game, I'm not saying he's going to light the world on fire. You know, he's not going to score that much. But I think the athleticism, the physicality, all of that combined. Ricky Council helped the Sixers win a couple games late in the season. He's an undrafted player. He, he even said it himself, like, I'm a dog. I'm ready to go out there and compete. That's a guy, if Nick Nurse decides to go with, just for a few spotty minutes, could make an impact, you know, just in the the environment, the vibe of the game. Um, but with the scoring punch, like I said, I hope it's Ubre. I hope Ubre steps up and and can give you that a little bit. So give me a little bit more background about Council because I have no idea who that is. Like, and I don't blame you. Um, undrafted <laughs> player. Uh, he was picked up. He was on a two-way for most of the year. And he came in later in the season. And there was one game against the Wizards where I think he had 20, 18 or 20 off the bench. Hmm. And he, you know, can't shoot that well, but he drives to the rim. He can dribble penetrate a little bit. He's aggressive. And he's just a, he's a he's a dog. He's one of those players. It almost feels like a guy who would fit on the Knicks. Like he gets scrappy. He's in there and he's going to get right up in your face. Pretty good defender. And, you know, just a guy that can provide more length on the perimeter. So Ricky Council has really impacted a game. And the last time he was in uh, the Sixers beat the Spurs in a double OT game. And he made an incredible pass driving to the rim, kind of jumped out beyond the baseline and winged it to the corner. Uh, for a clutch three and council didn't play a minute until the fourth quarter of that game game went into double OT 
think he ended up playing 20 minutes and he was incredible. So keep your, keep your eyes on Ricky council. He could be a guy that, you know, could kind of match some of that level of energy of the Knicks, but I don't know if he'll get in or not. Okay. Now from a Knicks standpoint, uh, there's not much to say change, not much to change other than Brunson and Dante just need to show up and get Hartenstein just in a groove, man. Like he missed, he was short on some floaters, have him be that facilitator that he can to be a big, but outside of that, like what you got as a bench production, fantastic. I would just say for the Knicks, just a test and beat. Like from a Knicks standpoint, like just test him. See, see if he's like, we know he's lingering. We know he's got a in- lingering knee injury. So why not see if he's going to be that guy? I felt like the Knicks left a lot on the table yesterday, especially in the second half where Embiid was just sagging and just off, off like while hedging. And it's like, he is hanging out in the paint, like just pick and pop at this point. Set set a good screen, get to the middle, put up a jump shot, have him work, or you know, just see if you can draw him out to the perimeter at all and have him chase. Like for me, it's just I, I want to see more of that. Those are the few things I think I want to see from the Knicks tomorrow. But other than that, like there's not really much to critique because they won game one. So yeah. game two is going to be interesting from uh for both fan bases. So looking forward to it, but RB appreciate you coming on the show, man, please let the listeners know where they can find you. And if you got anything up and coming, we should be on the lookout for. Absolutely, man. Yeah. You can find me everywhere. Uh, Philly take with RB on YouTube. We go live every Sixers game. So we'll be over there tomorrow night. We do post game coverage, all that in the third, and you can follow me on Twitter as well at RB Philly take. And I appreciate you having me on the platform. Love the channel and, and everything you guys do. Hopefully it's a different outcome tomorrow night. And I'll add one final thing, which is, I mean, it's obvious it's a given, but it was my biggest key coming into the series. If the Sixers get out rebounded the way they did last night, they don't have a shot because the Knicks are the number one offensive rebounding team for a reason. And the Sixers, you know, it, it's already hard enough to stop this team once or twice down the floor, but you're giving them three, four possessions or one time down the floor you're just going to wear out and you're going to wear Joel out. And, you know, if he's already not a hundred percent, you're just putting yourself in a very negative, you know, potential situation. So Sixers need to wake up. Somebody needs to become that guy. I don't know if they will, but that's what I'm looking for tomorrow night. Yeah, man. It'll be interesting because without a beat on the floor, man, it's, it was tough for your Sixers. The non MB minutes as everyone was talking about last night was interesting. And uh, conversely enough, it was the, I guess the non McBride minutes that were very tough, which I'm like, <laughs> if you told me that was going to be the script, that the non Embiid and the non McBride minutes were going to be the difference maker in game one, I would have been a little shocked that that was going to be the script. But hey, man, that is what it is at times. And that's why we love sports, man. The unknowing nature of the beast. And that's why I love it. But RB, appreciate you for coming through on the show. Make sure to give RB a follow on Twitter. Make sure to subscribe to his channel as well. He does great work over there. Come on, guys. Don't you want to know what the other fan base is saying during the playoffs? I like to learn. You guys should want to as well. So salute to RB. Thank you for coming through on the channel. And Knicks Nation, thank you for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. We previewed Game 2. Make sure to tap in. We're going to be doing a, a roundtable later tonight. And then, of course, you're going to have play-by-play. You're going to have a uh, post-game tomorrow. We're, we're, it's 24-7 coverage about this team, about this series. So make sure to always tap in. Hit that thumbs-up button for your boys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Salute to all the franchise channel members. Salute to everybody who just keeps tuning in and to Knicks, Knicks Nation overall. Support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. And make sure, if you want to go hang out with more Knicks fans, if you can't go to the Garden, watch party at sucker punch tomorrow make sure to go over there you know how to do it go online go get your tickets if you haven't done so already and we'll catch you later everyone all right we out